food security. In 2008, the price of many basic food products went through a dramatic rise before an equally rapid collapse. Many mainstream economists argue that this was due to real economic factors, such as increasing oil prices and higher demand from income growth in China and India. However, Gauss argues in her paper that these factors can only explain a very limited amount of the price changes and that financial speculation on commodity futures is a more important cause. What is a commodity future? A commodity future is a contract which allows the holder to buy or sell some given amount of a commodity at a set price at some future date. This, for example, a commodity on corn would allow the holder to purchase 100 kilograms of corn at 10 coins per kilo one year in the future. This could act in a way to ensure business stability, by ensuring that farmers can rely on a set future income, even if prices drop, or allowing businesses buying corn to be able to keep production chains going, even if the market for corn in the future makes it more difficult to purchase. However, futures can be traded, and this creates an incentive for people with no interest in either buying or selling corn to make money of speculating on corn futures. How does this work? Let's take the future we talked about earlier, allowing for corn to be bought to 10 coins per kilo in a year's time. Now imagine that new labour laws increase the price of corn production to 15 coins per kilo. Suddenly, the future, which allowed you to buy 1,000 coins worth of corn in a year's time, now allows you to buy 1,500 coins worth of corn. So its value goes up. So, if a speculator bought the future, before most people expected wages to rise and sold the future to someone else after the wage rise, they could make a substantial gain without ever buying any of the corn. These speculators, who buy and sell only futures with no interest in the underlying commodity, are known as index investors. At the height of the boom, it was estimated by the hedge fund manager, Michael Masters, in a testimony to the US Congress that even on the regulated exchange in the United States, such index investors owned approximately 35% of all corn futures contracts, 42% of all soybean contracts, and 64% of all wheat contracts in April 2008. The Mainstream View of Speculation From a neoclassical perspective, this speculation increases the efficiency of resource allocation across the spread of future contingencies, i.e. it allows people to make good plans for multiple different future timelines based on the reward or cost of that timeline to them and the probability of that timeline happening. If speculators were well informed and based their trades on real changes in supply and demand conditions for the commodity the future was based upon, this would bring the price of the future in line with the real price of the commodity determined by non-financial factors. So, taking the example earlier, by multiple speculators bidding for the now undervalued future, they would drive its price up to match its new value. Under this logic, future markets on many basic foodstuffs have been increasingly deregulated in order to create efficient markets free of the distortion created by regulation. The heterodox critique. Unfortunately, speculation often does not have the stabilizing effect because many of the assumptions on which this neoclassical model are based are flawed. Many traders do not have a good understanding of how future commodity prices may move, partially because these things are just extremely hard to predict. Instead, Many traders follow the alternating trends of market optimism and pessimism that they see other traders pursuing, or rationally decide to buy into a bubble, gambling that they can sell out of it at higher prices before the bubble bursts. This significantly detaches financial speculation from any real-world factors. Further, linking food markets with international finance causes these volatilities to spread to agricultural markets. Financial markets increase the uncertainty of food prices faced by buyers and sellers and make it difficult for either to act with real certainty, causing farmers to plant too much or too little to correctly meet future demand, even given the innate uncertainty of predicting even unfinancialized future market conditions. The Food Crisis 
Much of the speculation on food futures happened in the deregulated and highly financialized US economy. Deregulation combined with a constant search by investors for alternate sources of profits resulted in a large number of investors betting on future increases in food prices. This resulted in a prolonged period where the prices offered in future contracts were above current trading prices, known as spot prices. This had the effect of increasing spot prices. This speculation was triggered by real-world changes in supply and demand conditions, but greatly exaggerated the price changes that these real-world changes would otherwise have caused. Finally, around June 2008, investors began to sell off futures. As general market pessimism and the need for liquidity made them favor holding money over holding financial assets. However, even as global prices fell, high food prices remained in many developing countries, triggering numerous food crises. As many developing countries' governments did not have the policy room to reduce food prices, trade liberalization pushed by the World Trade Organization had decreased the food sovereignty of many of these countries and constricted international financial markets already filled with high amounts of US debt made it difficult for developing countries to finance grain imports through lending as US debt is seen by investors as a preferable asset to developing countries debt. Policy Solutions Gash argues that the policy solutions to this involve re-regulating commodity future markets to ban speculators, only allowing for those actually trading the commodity to use futures. Further, she suggests that a number of other institutions and policies could be used to increase food security, such as creating strategic grain reserves and easing the ability of developing countries to access loans to import food when needed. <coughs> Conclusion If you have found this interesting, I would strongly recommend you watch some of J.R.T. Gauche's interviews on the topic. She's a fascinating speaker and adds a lot more real-world detail to the outline I've described here. I've put a link to some of her interviews below. Also, please like, comment and subscribe if you want to see more videos.